Well, I was born in 1928 in Chicago, and uh, five years later, I entered the Chicago Public School System's kindergarten. Starting then, for the next 12 years, I learned that I was stupid and incapable of learning. It wasn't until I met Viola Spohn through the Second City, which had just opened, uh, that my life changed. I think that the creative act must transform the one who is in it. Not what he produces, but what happens to him or her. Viola worked with a teacher named Neva Boyd. Neva Boyd was like a collector of children's games. She learned from Neva Boyd and applied some of the same principles, which she learned about the importance of games to education. She applied that philosophy to teaching theater. She was um, working for the WPA and she was teaching immigrant children. Four kids in the south side of Chicago. She was this young, vibrant, 20-year-old lady saying, I have a theater company. How do I get these kids to not stand and talk? Viola was working with teenagers who would never touch each other. So she created a game where if they needed to speak on stage or if they wanted to speak on stage, they had to make physical contact with fellow players. So of course they do just hands or whatever. And then she said, okay, hands are out of the game. No hands. You gotta find a new way and you've gotta incorporate it. So you'd have to come up to somebody and say, What's going, you know? I mean, or, and then, then when you got really accomplished at it, what, once a part of the body, then that's out of the, that's out of the game. <laughs> His forearm and your side of your shoulder, then you gotta find new content. You found people touching noses, and it, it opened up, but you see, they weren't thinking of lines to say. Their focus was on the game. The lesson uh, is a focus and it's found within the rules of the game. So the idea is that the lesson is learned organically without a teacher having to explain what it is, and that way the student is actually teaching his or herself. She never ever mentioned how to anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never, you were never wrong. Mm -hmm. And you were never right. You just either did it or you didn't do it. Fear. Fear freezes you. But when they're playing a game, there's no time to be fearful because everyone is, you're focused. You understand the rules of the game and you're focused. You throw the ball, you catch it. Her use of focus is critical, you know. Every game has a focus. And if you apply yourself fully to that focus, you will lose your self-consciousness, you will lose your approval, disapproval syndrome, the, you know, how am I doing? Are they liking me or do, do, do they not like me? Because you're too busy, you're wound up on that focus and it should occupy you mind and body. But also that in that moment it allowed for you to go beyond yourself and find a moment of transcendence. The essence of Spolin Games is transformation. All of the exercises in the games came out of Seeking to tap, to tap the intuitive. Very few people get that. Even though it's written in her book so many different ways. And see if you get a new experience. I'm trying to get you to have a few new experiences here. But you put it in the hands of somebody with an ego, somebody who has something to lose, somebody who doesn't want to appear foolish, who wants to appear clever and smart. They're never going to have that. I don't know what's going to happen next moment. And again, I come back to the games. I think, I feel that the games do do this. Every single one of her games is designed to put you in that unknown area. Go where you don't know you're going to, what's going to happen next. 
And that's where the surprise for you as an actor is going to come from. That's where the growth as an artist is going to come from. And that's why the audience comes. It's, it's, you don't go to a game knowing what's going to happen next. You go to a baseball game wanting to see what happens. That's the drama of a game. And that's the excitement of theater games. Theater games are um, a way to teach acting to all age ranges, children to adults, in a non-authoritarian and non-psychological way. An interesting thing happened. The cameraman said, they're not pretending, they're really playing. <laughs> As if they were pretending I would throttle them. She did an exercise with us, a mirror exercise, following the follower, and I had such an amazing reaction to it. I was stunned, literally shaken, and I knew that this was profound, something profound had changed in me. She would, we would mirror and she'd have A and B. Ah, see that? And then you'd find yourself, uh, if I was going to, I was A, I would do that, and then my person, the other person opposite would, would, would mirror me. And then she'd say, now B, and B would do something else and maybe lean in, look at themselves in the mirror. It was actually using it as a mirror. And then she'd say, she'd go A. B, and, and she'd side coach more rapidly, and then she'd say, okay, now nobody initiate. And you suddenly were in this flow, and it was so wonderful, and so um, it's safe. It's safe if the other player is there with you. And don't, and then she'd say, and don't try to trip up the person. That's not mirror. Mir All her work is coming together. It's cooperating, it's connecting, it's supporting, it's setting somebody up for a goal, not rushing to make the goal yourself. Her whole way of work, and that's what I found so fascinating. A feeling of oneness. Of All right, did you hear that? Did you hear that? They had a feeling of oneness. Now what's nicer than having a feeling of oneness? When you're standing all alone in a crowd, right? And you're all alone in a schoolroom. Are you all alone and wherever? And this, following the follower does produce a unity and a union. She came up with one one day. First time she did it, first time she introduced it. And it was spacewalk. You're walking through space. Well, as you walk through space, get the feeling of the space that you're walking through. Don't try to think about it, try to feel it. And we're moving around, walking around the stage, doing this. She said, let the space support you. Feel the space move through you. Uh, let the space support your, uh, your skull, under your chin. She said, now leave a little space between the floor of the stage and the bottom of your foot. And I thought, oh boy, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna try this. Well, my body didn't levitate. It was supposed to but my mind did. And a very big with, with Viola's work was side coaching. Now I'm going to do something I call side coaching. Yeah, when you use theater games and performance, you do side coach. And so the coaching is an essential part of a Spolin, an evening of Spolin games. I'm going to say different things to you. And as far as you are able, follow through with what I say. Now, a lot of improvisers, what they'll do is they'll simply go on stage, succeed or fail, and then get notes afterwards, where they're missing out on the best part of Spolin Games, which is to have a side coach diagnosing something's going wrong, somebody's, somebody's not on track, somebody's feeling a little too urgent, is going for the laugh, and if I yell, slow motion, now look at each other in slow motion. Everyone can slow down and refocus. And turn around to see someone else in slow motion. All right, is that a different experience for you? You know, and I think it's a technique that should be used more often, but it's the hallmark of Spolin Games. Oh, keep going. Oh. Keep going. <laughs> I do think it's important that she's honored as the creator of the game because it's a unique art form. It's 
an American art form created by a woman. You know, I mean, improvisation existed before viola, obviously, but to codify it and put it, you know, uh, make an entire educational system around it. You know, viola's whole approach to education, to me, is so well thought and so well written about, in, in, especially in the early editions of, of the improvisation of the theater, where she, she lists the things that a workshop conductor should be doing. I've been reading that book for the last 30 years, and it, it, it's like it never gets dull. I see some new insight. Her book is, has been the Northwestern University Press's best-selling book for um, a long time now. So I always use the book as inspiration. It is just brilliant. It's a, it's a revolutionary way of approaching teaching. You know, I remember the very first class I was telling you about, you know, I, I went up to Viola Spolin after the class because I had such an experience. I said, I want to thank you, Viola. She said, don't thank me. Don't thank me. It's not me. It's the work. It's the work. Don't make me your guru. Get out, she would say. But what she was saying, so concerned about that she didn't want people to guruize her, to make her the ooh. She used to say, don't get misty moisty. And misty moisty meant ooh, I'm in the spiritual realm. She said, no, it's practical, it's real space, it's right there, it's a theater seat, you know, and you can grab it, you can pull on it, you know. She, she, she did not mystify it, although sometimes, you know, we'd be having a glass of wine and her hot place and I, I don't drink but I would be having Diet Coke and she would say um, things like yes she'd been told you are a priestess from another time um, you um, you've opened an ancient door she also uh, said you know truly the church no the theater is a church and in it we worship God you know, Viola once one time told us, she said, what, what do you think creativity is? And so we're all racking our brains trying to think of clever, you know, wonderful things to describe creativity. She said, well, I'll tell you what it's not. She'd say, creativity is not the clever rearranging of the known. And a lot of improv has become the rearranging of known common material. And the more clever you can rearrange it and, and fast, quickly transform it into some comedy. That's what improv has become. So I really think that there's a distinction now between improvisation and theater games. They're, they're two different art forms. And theater games can inform improvisation, but the way improvisation now is thought of, it's thought of as clever comedy and ad lib, and that's not what Viola was about. So go into the unknown. Well, keep going. Oh. described her book when it first came out, Improvisation for the Theater. Mm -hmm. Dick, no matter how old you get, remember to play. Now I'm 81 and I'm still playing.